Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for invitation, for possibility to give lectures. First of all, let me apologize. I'm very jet lagged, so I just came from Canada and I woke up at 3 a.m. So I can be slow, but maybe it will be good. It will be pedagogical. Um, and also I have no idea what you were told last week. I have no idea what people promised that I will tell you. <laughs> Uh, so, but anyhow, my intention is that uh, the following, that I will try to talk about localization. I will stress number of mathematical aspects. So I will tell you, you know, I mean, about notions like, I will talk about index theorems. I will talk about elliptic, transverse elliptic operators. So I will touch all these mathematical aspects. And eventually one of my main application, I will tell you about five D gauge theories in this mathematical, you know, thing. Uh, so actually, I don't know if you were told, but I will start by deriving a very basic things and I will stress mathematical aspects. So I will actually start from deriving for you Atiyah bot theorem. So first in toy model and then I will progress, I will make it more complicated and, you know, from finite dimensional I will go to infinite dimensional. And so imagine I have a smooth manifold and I have a U1 action. Okay. Um, if you don't know something, let me know, but I will basically, I'm a rather mathematically, I mean, oriented person. So I would like to associate for this manifold uh, what's called typically super manifold or graded manifold. So what I will do, I take a tangent bundle and I shift degree by one. So locally, if I think I would have a coordinate x mu, and then here I will have my psi mu. So psi mu, it's a Grassmannian variable, so it's a Grassmannian, Grassmannian variable. And it transforms, so psi mu transforms the same way as uh, dx mu. So it means that, uh, remember that differential transforms in this way. So if I change coordinates, right, so if I change coordinates, again, I'm assuming that then my psi mu would transform exactly like this. But the only difference is that it's an odd guy. Okay. So what is important, one of the important facts about uh, the thing that um, if I'm looking at this super manifold, so fact, that this integration is canonically, whatever I integrate, we will discuss it, but this is canonically defined. <coughs> so I would like, so I will give you some hints, but as a first exercise, prove it. So the hint is the following. So if you don't know, um, uh, Gras so Grassmann integral, so I will give you a hint how to define. So the Grassmann integral is defined in the following way. So if I have a one variable, if I integrate constant, this is equal to zero. If I integrate one psi, this is equal to one. Okay. So this is a very important fact when we will deal with localization. And that is also important when we do this for path <coughs> integral. Uh, so because of this very strange property, it's important that, uh, for example, if I change my variable, so if psi tilde is equal to some constant times psi, I still have to have this property. Then if you look at this thing, then the only way to have this property is actually to say that delta psi tilde transform as a one of a delta psi. 
So you see, this is opposite what you would expect from x. So just to compare, if you would have x tilde equal to ax, then dx tilde is equal to a dx. So I'm asking you to prove it. So it means that the following thing, what's going on. So this part of the integral changes by uh, determinant of this matrix. And then you have to work out that this guy changes by one over determinant that they cancel out, OK? So this is first exercise. And uh, there are a lot of conventions when you define these guys is how to order, et cetera, because uh, you know, I have more than one psi and the anti-commuting, et cetera. OK. Good. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, but this is T, not T star. It's, it's T. This is important thing. So now, if you want to do another exercise, if you would do T star, for example, so this is a big deal. If it would be T star, then uh, my psi will transform as a derivative. And for example, this is not true. So it's not canonically defined. So you need a density to define. So just, I mean. So this fact is very, very important. Um, so now let me say the following things. Then, uh, as I told you, I have U1 action. And let me assume that I will have a corresponding vector field. So I have a vector field for this guy. OK. So then let me write um, the following transformations here. Delta of x mu is equal to delta psi mu. Delta psi mu goes to v mu of x. So I will call it supersymmetry. So let's discuss what it means exactly geometrically. So first of all, what I would like to do, I would like to integrate functions on this manifold. So my functions uh, will be from x and psi. Okay. So if I expand them, right, because psi is Grassmannian, I basically will have mu1, mu k of all k's, psi mu1, psi mu k. So of course, my functions here one to one correspondence with differential forms. So if you want to write it in a fancy language, you can write like this. It's differential forms. And in fact, this gradient, so this is, uh, I mean, I put here one because I put a degree one here. I like a degree one. So the degree of the form corresponds exactly, I mean, to degree of this space. OK. Then um, what about the supersymmetry? So if I act on alpha x psi, right? So it's very obvious what I will do. So if I'm just writing this, this would be is the following. So I will first, when I act on x, I will have d rho alpha mu 1 mu k psi rho mu 1 psi mu k plus. Then you will have different terms alpha mu 1 mu k v mu 1 psi mu 2, psi mu k, etc. So I'm just doing these transformations on this side. <coughs> OK. So what you can convince yourself very easily, and there are some conventions involved which I'm not actually fixing. So quite often, canonically, people, if you look at the textbooks in differential geometry, the most canonical way is to put here 1 over k factorial just conventions. So in principle, I have to have here 1 over k factorial. And then here, I will have 1 over k factorial, etc. Anyhow, the upshot is that at the level of differential forms, this guy corresponds to the following operation, d plus iv. 
So D is a Dirac differential. And this is a contraction, contraction that is a vector field. So this guy I will denote in future as a DV. And this has a name, it's called equivalent differential. Differential. So one of the things what you can see, and again, you can do this in local coordinates, but there is the following thing that if I square my delta to, well, let me say dv to square, right? This is just, so this by itself is zero, this is by itself is zero, and the only thing which just survives is this operation d, iv plus ivd. This is just a lead derivative for v. So by the way, I assume that you know differential geometry. <laughs> okay, so I'm very fast with this because if you don't know, then good, good, then goodbye, basically. <laughs> okay, um, so this is equal to Lee derivative acting on the forms. Uh, so le again, le I will introduce now different uh, notions. Uh, so what quite often people do when they discuss differential, uh, this uh, equivalent differential, is the following thing. Uh, so the problem with this guy is that um, this is would raise your degree by one up, and this will allow degree by one, right? So one of the properties is that D acts its P form to P plus one form, while IV it's from P form to P minus one form, okay? Uh, now, quite often, it's can to introduce formal parameters. So this is just a formal parameter. Um, and then I introduced uh, what I would say that I would say that it's degree equal to two. And then typically mathematicians, when they discuss this differential, they write like this. And this object now acts on differential forms on M, which you regard <laughs> as a formal expansion in Xi. So it's a forms, and then you're allowed to have multiply Xi, I mean, in polynomial fashion. So it basically it makes, it allows you to have the subject of the same degree. So you change the notion of degree. So it's not only differential forms, it's these guys. Now, if you a look at guys which is invariant. So if you look at invariant uh, forms, so invariant means the, the following, that my form will be annihilated by, so it depends on, it may depend on Xi. It's equal to zero. So if I look on the invariant forms, then this guy squares to zero because before it was, so then I have a, a complex. So this is invariant form on M. And then I have a equivalent differential. So on all forms, it's not a differential, it does not square to zero. But if I look at invariant form, it squares to zero. So it's cohomology, so this cohomology typically denoted. So in this case, I'm just considering U1. Uh, so it's called equivalent cohomology. Cohomology. And this guy in called Cartan model. Cartan model of equivalent cohomology. There are many other models. Right. Okay. So I'm good. I'm going to use later on about. So I'm deriving at here both formulas, but I'm also telling you the K word. So I'm going to use all these words, element of equivalent cohomology. So this is Cartan model. There are alternative ways of building uh, 
equivalent homology. One is called Weil model, then there is BRST models, etc. So there are many. Uh, but they give rise to the same cohomology. So just idea, so idea that this object actually is the same as a cohomology of a quotient space. But the main thing is that uh, M over U1, if it exists, if it exists, because quite often my action may not be free, it may have fixed points. So this does not exist. So this object always is well defined. But this object is defined only if uh, U1 acts freely, so it does not have fixed points. And this is actually a bit boring in some sense for us. Okay. Uh, good, so let me see. Okay, good. So, um, this is the setup. So we would like, so this is my supersymmetry written where it's written somewhere, or maybe I erased already. Uh, so I have my supersymmetry written in local coordinates. Uh, okay, so this is my SUSY. And I would like to study these functions, which is killed by this. So this is what I will call equivalently equivariently closed form. So what is important that this condition, so for now uh, I will assume like physicists do, so I just assume that xi is equal to 1. So I'm not carrying this formal parameter. But I just wanted to tell you that this is very important for keeping track of grading, etc. And for example, it's very important for this statement, actually, if you want to make precise. So it's, I mean, this parameter size is required. But I will do like a physicist, I will just put it to one. Sorry, it's psi here. Uh, so one of the comments is the following, that if I actually um, look at these conditions because of my degrees, so the actually this condition, uh, if I expand in this guys, it will involve a, a you know, low degree form, etc. For example, let's say for definiteness that dimensions of M is even, then this would involve top form here. So if I want to solve this condition being currently closed, it's necessary involves all forms. So my goal is to calculate, so goal, to calculate the following integral. So provided that delta of alpha is equal to zero. Okay. So let me denote this that z to zero. So the trick is, which I will, again, I'm sure you were told about this trick already, but I will basically, I would like to stress some features of this trick and also explain you some math. I will make it more and more complicated as we go along. But the trick is the following, that I can deform this action by the term minus delta of w. It's not a function. And then you can prove very uh, a simple theorem. Again, for now I'm working for compact manifolds, so M is compact, etc. So it means that I can use uh, integration by parts that's without any troubles. But the thing is that uh, if I assume that delta square of W is equal to zero, then it follows then d zeta dt is equal to zero. So this is done. Sorry, I forgot to put here t. 
So this is done very trivially. You differentiate over t, this goes down, and then you have to differentiate by parts. And then when you hit delta on alpha, it's zero, and then it hits another time, uh, this delta w. So the only term which is actually problematic is this. One term which contains this guy, and I put it to zero, okay? So if I choose, so if we choose delta w equal to zero, then we can do the following thing. So if I want to calculate at zero, since it's independent of t, I can send t to infinity. So I just have to calculate whatever I mean, will survive at um, t goes to infinity. So let's discuss uh, what is going on here. Okay, so for this concrete example, I can take my... Uh, W to be uh, G mu, G mu nu, psi nu. So where G is the metric. So um, first of all, statement number one, which please you do it yourself. It's pretty trivial statement. Uh, this is equal to zero if the derivative of V of G is equal to zero. So V is a killing. So V is a killing vector. Okay. So for compact manifold, uh, this is not a problem. It's not actually a condition because if the group you want acts, you can always have a metric by averaging. So this is not actually a condition. Uh, if it's not a group action, if it's non-compact, then it can be rather non-trivial condition. Okay. So now uh, let's calculate exactly what we have here. So our integral, so if I calculate delta w, this is equal to the following thing. So just remember, so this is v mu, g mu nu, v nu, plus psi mu, psi nu. And then here I will have basically uh, G mu rho V rho derivative of nu. So in case if I'm too fast, just I mean, do it yourself at the evening instead of drinking alcoholic beverages so you can repeat my calculations. But okay, um, so that's what you get here. So that's what I have to put there. So if I put there, then um, so let me just, uh, I will denote by the same letter uh, V and also when I con contract form. So let me not introduce another letter. So you will see from contents if it has index downstairs or upstairs. But what we get, so what we have to do with you, it's T goes to infinity, dn x, dn psi, alpha x psi, e minus T, then I have a norm of V minus T psi mu psi rho. And then I will have basically dV mu rho. Okay. So I have to take T to infinity. So the term which dominates, so if this, this is positive guy, so the only term which would survive, it's when V equal to zero. So only when norm is equal to zero will contribute, meaning that V equal to zero. And this is exactly fixed points. So if the action is free, then this integral actually will go to collapse. So there will be nothing interesting. Because if the action is free, this is never zero. So it will just be suppressed. Okay. Right. Uh, so 
of course, on the manifold time, we have many points. So uh, let's concentrate. Let's look at one fixed point. And let me assume that this point is zero. Just I can choose coordinates, so I'm looking at neighborhood of one point. <coughs> okay. So then uh, what I can do, I can, of course, take this expression and I can uh, do the expansion. So I will have these guys and I will expand, first of all, this term. So I will have, let me write abstractly, h mu nu, x mu, x nu. There will be no linear terms. I hope it's obvious. Uh, plus, if I expand this, then the next terms will be order of cube. So I will give you later on a rather complicated exercise to repeat it for some case. So now I also assume that this point is isolated. So isolated, it's in fact exactly mean that my expression will st start from quadratic term. And what is important is that this matrix is not degenerate. Okay. So this is, I'm just expanding this term. Then I have to expand this term. So what I will have, I will have S mu nu, psi mu, psi nu. So this is some matrices. I, you know, I will tell you that actually I don't need to know them. But in principle, if you're a strong person, you can just actually take and do expansion of metric, of field, combine different terms, etc. So write very explicitly. So this is concrete geometrical object, but actually I don't care how they look like. And I will tell, and you will see later on why. And then here I will start to have terms. So the next term will be of order of o, uh, psi square of x, etc. Right? That's the terms will appear. So then uh, let me do the following change of variables. So let me say that my x tilde is equal to square root of t x and psi tilde is equal to square root of t of psi. So then I'm looking at this object, right? So I want to calculate zeta of 0 equal to limit of t to infinity. So now here, what is very, very important, and that's what I told you. So when I do this change of variables, my measure transforms canonically. And so in fact, I did erase this already statement, but there will be no any Jacobian in the transformations for this guy. So this is actually will be dn of x tilde, dn psi of tilde. Okay. So this is an important, crucial thing. And that's actually an infinite dimensional setup. It's a uh, big deal. So you do this. So when I rescale this t's, this will transform as a power of t. This will transform exactly opposite way. OK, uh, then next thing is that I will have alpha. And then here I have to write this as x tilde square root of t, psi tilde square root of t, right? And then what I will have there, I will have here the minus uh, h mu nu, x tilde mu, x tilde nu. So you see, I had exactly, I have t, I have quadratic term, I rescaled. But the next term will be order of 1 over square root of t, because it starts from x cubed there. And then. Um, Next thing is I will have here minus s mu nu psi tilde mu psi tilde nu. And then again, I have just to analyze how this term goes. And this is what be again of order 1 over square root of t. So now I actually can take t to 0, sorry, to infinity. And then what I get, I get the following thing. I will get alpha 0 of 0, 
So because anything which has psi will just disappear. So I have a loud guy which does not have psi. It's at zero. Uh, and then I have to have inside the following integral <coughs> dnx tilde dn psi tilde on e minus h mu nu x tilde mu x tilde nu minus s mu nu psi tilde mu psi tilde mu. Okay. Well, then I will just have to do this integral and up to some pi's, which you can figure out yourself, up to some pi's. This is the following thing. So this is a bosonic integration. So I will have alpha 0, 0. So this is just a standard determinant of h. So this is fermionic integration. So this goes up. So this you can write two ways. I mean, so this is a Pfaffian of S. So just remember that for anti so S by definition anti-symmetric. So this is symmetric, this is anti-symmetric. So Pfaffian of S, this is just a way of taking a square root of S. And this you can do only when this is anti-symmetric. Okay. Okay, uh, this is not the result we are satisfied, but this is the result. And uh, so here what is important before we analyze this further, and uh, eventually we'll do these similar things with uh, differential operators. Does H has to be uh, positive definite? Mm -hmm. H, H, H. Yes, H has to be positive definite, but this is guaranteed by this, right? I mean, if it's not positive definite, it's not defined. So, for example, one of the things, I mean, the typical problem you will have if you try to mimic this on non-compact space, so this is typically metric may be not uh, definite, etc. So now everything definite defined. So what is important for this expression to make sense, this matrix should be non-degenerate. So remember, I had the SUSI. So I had a SUSI uh, written there. So I had these things for you. So now um, I would like to write my transformations in these variables with rescale t and actually take t to infinity. So if you do it, you will have a linear rise. So I will have actually delta x tilde mu is equal to psi tilde mu. And then I will have here delta psi tilde mu is equal to now I will have d rho v mu at 0 x tilde rho. So uh, all other terms just will die out if I do the thing. So this is linearized Susan. So now actually, uh, why I told you you don't need to know this matrices exactly. So you can actually do this calculation right away and see. But you also can look at this term. So this term I can call it delta w up to quadratic order. So I don't know, quadratic order. And then what I can check is that, so let me put here subscript L, so it's a linear guys. So what I can do, I can actually ask that this term, if I look at the linear guys, and this guy, this is equal to zero. So it's analog of the conditions I had here, but now I can do it up to linearized level. So if you do it, so again, it's exercise, you can do it very easily. So just take these guys and apply to this combination and require that this is zero. What you will get, you will get the following fact. You will get that h mu nu is equal to d mu v rho from zero s rho nu. Okay.
Is there is some way to get this board down? Oh. Stick. Stick. Oh, I thought it's more advanced. <laughs> uh, here it is. <laughs> A I see. Low tech. Okay. Twenty first century. Okay. Right. Uh, so I would like that you stare at this thing up there. Right, so let's put everything together. So I told you that you calculate this, you apply linearized thing, and what you eventually get, so we had alpha zero at zero is equal to Fafian of S, determinant of H. Then what I told you here, it's exactly that H is equal to some matrix composed of uh, first derivative of V times S. Right, so then it just cancel out, so you will get alpha zero is equal to one over square root of determinant delta mu v rho from zero. And that's what you have to calculate. So finally, let me make a statement, a theorem, and then let's discuss it, and let me give you exercise. So the theorem, which is goes under the name of Atiyabot formula. So if I have to calculate for you this integral, so with the conditions that delta alpha is equal to zero, then this is equal to sum over fixed points Okay, so now let me be honest, so, but you can restore the thing. So this is equal to pi dimensions of m over two. And then here you will have alpha zero at fixed point. So I have to sum them up. And then here I will have a determinant of this matrix. So this is called at your board. Okay. Um, uh, zero of uh, x. X fixed yeah, sorry, yeah. X, thank you. X fixed point. Okay. So I would like to stress for you the thing. So what I'm doing is triviality. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that there is different steps of calculation because as we go along, I mean, in a while, I will consider more complicated models, still finite dimensional. And then we will have more fields, more stuff, etc. But There always will be a tooth set of calculations. And also what people do in localization literature. So either you take a sec, I mean, uh, matrices, which is uh, quadratic, and you do Gaussian integrations, you get something like there. Or because your term has extra symmetries, I mean, these things linearized, and then you actually go here. So what is important that this term, so I mean, if I want actually to produce answer for me, it's much more important to know this. Not full supersymmetry nonlinear, but only linear I think, around fixed points. Okay. So this is very important. And people actually, when we'll do index theorems, et cetera, I will explain to you that there is this calculation. It's a valid calculation, but then you can simplify it even one step further. So now let me give you exercise and uh, marginal statement. And this is hard exercise, but if you're brave, you can do it. Uh, so what I did here and the way I derived for you, I assume that my fixed points are isolated. But quite often, I may have not isolated fixed locus. So it can be some submanifold. So actually, the general idea about formula is the following type. So if I would have dn of uh, so let me write this a differential form. So if I integrate my currently closed differential form, uh, then actually I can reduce over in invariant subset. So my this is a set of fixed points on the U1 action. And then I have to evaluate my alpha at this set of fixed points. And then here will be a earlier class of a normal uh, bundle for this guy. 
So I suggest for you to derive this formula, but not um, let me tell you how to derive it. Not because in most of the books um, it's written as a two-line statement because there is a lot of formal nonsense, push forward, pullbacks, etc. Et you derive this formula. Do it like a real physicist. Uh, so what you do, you're supposed to do, you have to repeat this calculation. The thing is that uh, when you expand over the things, uh, so remember what you have to do, you have your manifold. You have a fixed locus, so you have to split coordinates along the fixed locus and transverse the fixed locus. And before you assume that your metric, I mean, you just need to know metric at one point. But in this case, you actually have to start to expand metric, and that's why curvature will appear. So do it honestly. So then basically what you have to do, you still have to expand everything up to quadratic order, but you have to differentiate. So what I'm saying to you, this is my fixed locus manifold. And then I would have, for example, x uh, i's here, and this would be x alphas. So the way I would expand, for example, things will differ. And that's curvature terms will appear. And eventually, if you do it very explicitly, you have to, for example, very convenient to use normal coordinates. And then you can get this expression very explicitly. And then you can identify with the formal nonsense. But I actually suggest to you once in your life to derive it explicitly. It's hard exercise, OK? You have to remember a lot of stuff. But in principle, it's a straightforward exercise. OK. Good. Uh, any questions before I go to a more complicated setup? So everything is crystal clear, right? So no, next, I would like to also uh, derive for you some finite dimensional uh, model, which is a bit more complicated, and also start to discuss some mathematical issues. So here we were integrating manifolds. So here in this example, my supersymmetry was simple. So this example, just to confront, I will have two examples. So here, this was my super manifold, and that was my SUSY. So next thing, which is also from this example, I will jump right away to infinite dimensional setting. Uh, so assume that I have some vector bundle. So I have a vector bundle. Okay. So quite often it's, so my super manifold here would be the following. I will take a vector bundle shift by degree one. So this is notation is the following. It means that my fiber coordinates is dig odd, but my base guys are even. So this is just, so what I'm doing is I'm shifting. Uh, so this is a vector bundle. So I have my X mu still coordinate, and then I have chi A in other coordinates. So this is odd, and this is uh, just some expanded in the basis of sections of E. Right. So now my super manifold way I actually would like to solve the problem is one, this one. I don't need, well, this is. So I take a vector bundle, I shift degree one. I will write for you in local coordinate. Then I take a tangent bundle and I shift by degree one. Okay. So if you want, I, then I'm writing everything. Uh, so my coordinates will be the following x mu. So I will still have part of the old problem I had before. I will have psi mu. So this guy transforms as um, dx mu. 
Then I will have chi A. This is just a section, transforms as a section of E. And then here H A. And this is also odd, so this is uh, even, odd, odd, <coughs> and this is even. And here where life becomes complicated but nothing you can do, it transforms a D of XA. Section, it's a coordinate, right? I mean, it's a oh. coordinate to the map. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, the, uh, the level. I'm just locked. Thank you. DKA. Okay. So now uh, let me give you a big. So this is unfortunately half of the physicists don't understand it. Vector bundle of a vector bundle is not a vector bundle. This is a mantra easy to remember, but this is in a way very trivial thing is that if I have a, a vector bundle, for example, E, and I take another vector bundle o over this, so I'm taking T of this guy. I actually cannot think of this as a vector bundle as of original space, okay? So what I'm telling you that I take a vector bundle over M, then I take a again bundle over this space as a total manifold. I cannot think of a whole as a vector bundle over M. And in local coordinates, it's actually mean the following. It means that this transform as a section, but this does not transform as a section, does not transform as a section. I mean, this is a very simple exercise. Uh, so let me just give you some hints and then you can do. When you put D here, this mean D over the initial manifold or, or, or over the vector bundle? Over vector bundle. I, I want to have differential for this guy. So if you think, so what you are doing is the following. I'm thinking this is a, so I have my manifold, right, which is E1. So it has a coordinates X, mu, and chi A. So this is a section, meaning that chi a tilde transforms, so there is some transition functions G A B of X as a chi B. So I choose my bundle, whatever my bundle is, there is a transition function, so you can define them, and that's how it transforms. And then over the super manifold, I again would like to introduce, I mean DRAM, would like to switch parity, etc. So then of course my fibers formula, right? So it will be dx mu. So for this, I would like to associate, well, associate psi mu, and then there will be d chi a to associate uh, ha. So now the problem, what I'm highlighting for you, that this is, I mean, this is very well defined object geometrically in certain sense, but this is not a section simply because if I take this formula, so d chi tilde a, this is uh, G A B of X chi B plus uh, G A B rho dx rho chi B. So if I, sorry, here I forgot to write D. So what I'm saying that if I would identify this with a chi A tilde, this is my chi A then it does not transform as a section. That's exactly this magical statement. Okay? 
So it means typically there are two ways of resolving uh, these things. Either you introduce connection or, uh, or you just don't care about this, but then you have to be preoccupied with coherence. So it's all important thing is because um, why I'm telling you this stuff? Because uh, I could easily lie to you, but for example, I cannot write for you, I mean, any object like this on the bundle. I mean, this is bad. This is bad. Because if my H will be a section, uh, then it's fine if I introduce metric, but because of this property. Okay. So it's a complication, but there is nothing we can do actually because um, many formulas sometimes involve some non canonical choices, etc. So So one of the way of writing it, so um, this is one thing I wanted to highlight for you. Uh, so another thing that what I'm going to do, I'm going to discuss. So my bundle E would be a QRN bundle. So when we will discuss, uh, so it means the following, that uh, I will have action on M. Right, don't forget that I always would have my action on U1, on M. So this action also exists on E, so I can lift it on E. And this action is compatible with this projection map. So this is called an EQRN bundle. I will give you examples, so when we'll do calculations, for example, for S5, I will give you very concrete examples. Uh, but this is quite natural that, you know, I have a bundle. For example, if I have S2, it has a rotation of U1, and most of the bundles I can put, I mean, they're the most interesting bundle, they will be current, so they will respect the action of uh, U1. Okay. So then I would like to write for you a supersymmetry here. So naively, and again, uh, if I have action of uh, of vector, f I mean u1 here, I'm saying it's lifted here. So there will exist analog of lead derivative here. Sometimes it looks complicated, depends on the bundle. I'm not going to write for you the formula. Anyhow, in a moment, I will give you a linearized version. But let's write things here. So I had my supersymmetry, this one. So this is what we discussed before. And then here I have to write, uh, so let me write first naive thing. So this is operation whatever will correspond to my infinitesimal, I mean it's infinitesimal action of U1 which I lift on the vector bundle. Okay. So this is appropriately defined lead derivative. Again, it's a tricky thing how to define this lead derivative because depending on the bundles, for example, for spin bundles, defining lead derivative requires certain imagination. They can be defined. But it's an important thing that it's a linear operation which is compatible with action of U1 with all these maps. Uh, so what I wanted to tell you is that uh, this is not a good thing. So typically there is a way of covariantizing. So quite often, there is actually a covariant version of these guys. Plus some extra terms, plus extra terms. So just let me say you that this is just some connection which I choose. So whole thing is here done that I'm introducing connection such a way that I can claim that this is a uh, uh, transformer section, this transformer section. Then I can write expressions like this. Sorry, in the lowest formula, 
Sorry, Kai, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so be aware of these facts and, um, you know, uh, there is this extra complication. So, for example, when you derive, I mean, this is in fact a setup to derive um, Euler theorem through the curvature, etc. And the curvature actually appears exactly because of these terms. Otherwise, you cannot write burst exact terms. So, we'll, when I will write construct for you this I'm not going to do it, so I will, uh, but basically I have to do this, guys, etc. Uh, it's important that I'm using these formulas, not this guy. So this correct and this correct. Uh, but uh, squaring H, I have to make sure that it transforms a section. Okay. So this is one of the co uh, complications. So now um, I would like. Uh, is that canonically defined? Uh, well. Uh, the covariant form. No, 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 no. This is this is exactly pain. It's not canonically defined. You have to make a choice. Okay. So these formulas, I mean, I have to write. Uh, you know, I have to make choice, and that's it. I mean, unfortunately, nothing you can do. This is not canonical, but you have to do it. If you don't do it, you cannot actually uh, write things like this. Okay. Um, but in a, in a way, this is not now, this new guy is not a DRAM of chi formula, so it's a covariantized version. But what is important that because of its DRAM, again, there is a f so f the same statements as before. So if I write for you uh, this guy, so I can write this as a, just to differentiate them. Okay, so D and um, chi rank of R, R H. It's again canonical measure. So one of the important thing of localization, if you believe in localization, it actually gives you a canonical measure for doing in path integral, etc. Okay. So this is canonical, and in fact, you can switch to these guys, and also, uh, since there is a linear uh, shift transformations, it also will be canonical measure in this new coordinates. Okay, so uh, let me skip the following step, uh, where basically I can do this same mantra. Okay, now let construct me W, let me take a form, integrate over this, blah, 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 everything goes to fixed points, etc., etc. Sorry? Yeah. In this case, uh, E is not compact, right? so Yes, but life is getting complicated. That's exactly, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, life, it's not compact. You have to think what to define, etc. So, for example, one of the things is that you cannot put any object and integrate it. So, for example, if you integrate things which decays fast enough, then it's okay. Okay. Uh, so, this mantra I'm skipping, but in principle, I have more fields, and now my, so I have collections of even and odd fields, so I would like to, you know, repeat the same mantra. But let me not uh, re tell you this Atiyabot argument, it goes through completely. So, let me actually try to analyze the situation at the level of uh, linearized things, and try to understand how final answer will look like. And this is, in fact, much more close to the field theory. Okay, I have 15 minutes, so let me start this story. Okay. Uh, so what my goal is the following. I have these transformations, whatever the way to look. Yep. You have half an hour, I think. Hmm? You have half an hour. Half an hour? So Why I thought that? 15. Okay, I forgot, sorry. Good. Uh, Okay, so let me tell you what I want to do. Uh, so I'm skipping this part where in this more complicated model uh, you can do stuff. So by the way, as exercise for you, uh, you can uh, look uh, for Matai equilin representative, you can play with these formulas, etc. 
I don't give you references, but for example, you can definitely, I mean, there are millions of places in this. There is summary of this construction if you look at passed um, uh, on um, a, s a small uh, paper in, in our big volume on localization. So for example, he discusses this issue there. So you can write, I mean, at th this is at the level one, two pages. So this is a very nice model. I suggest you to play with this and, uh, you know, get it. I mean, if I'm alive, I can tell you maybe, I mean, later during exercise classes, how it's done actually. But right now I would like to actually linearize this, this problem. So let's just look how it will uh, look about. Um, so this will go to Psi mu, right? Then, uh, let me draw indices because it will be obvious, right? So delta psi goes to i zero x. So this is exactly this formula. So I'm just saying is delta x goes to psi, delta psi goes to some matrix times x. So I'm just doing linear right thing. So this is a linear operator now. And then delta chi goes to H, and delta H goes again to li another linear operator, chi. Okay. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, so here, I still have to tell you how localization works here. So before I go to linear, I think. So actually, um, in this story, so I'm writing this. This I typically cover and I replaced by this. And then I have to write for you this term. And the most interesting thing would arise from the following. A, B, H, B, minus S, B of X. So where S B, so where S is a section of E. So by the way, of course, you can add the same term you added before, I mean, we had it before. So you see now it's important that my H is cover covariant and contains connection because otherwise one of the terms when I hit by delta, I will get H paired with the metric H. So this is metric on fibers, metric on E. This is metric on uh, M. So S is a section. So I told you there will be two conditions. So if I will start now to check this thing, And of course, there will be one conditions coming from here that it should be killing guy. Uh, but then there also will be conditions for the section, which let me tell you now in the fancy words, but we will derive it at linearized level. So my section, this should be equivalent section. Uh, with respect, with respect to U1. So again, remember that section, if I have E over M, so my section is a map from M to uh, E. So equivalent means the following thing, that because eventually when localized at zeros of this section, uh, so I have U1, it moves points here. What is important then when I will put, look at zeros of the section, my action should be such that it does not move points. So if I pick up arbitrary section, then my U1 action may move it zero. So equivalent, I mean, um, is exactly uh, basically this condition. I mean, there is a purely mathematical definition which I don't want to give you. I mean, I will derive for you 
at a linearized uh, I mean, level at, as a physicist. But this is two conditions, I mean, you have to keep in mind. And this is what we are writing here, okay? So be why I'm discussing this section? Because for me, it would be important um, actually think about this section as something linearized, right? So I will have for you the following operation. So there will be S, uh, B, rho at zero. So this would be this matrix, which I will call D. So let's forget all this geometry and let's just look things at linearized level and analyze them. Because this is what actually matters when we will do very concrete calculations. Sir, does it impose some constraint on metric on sections? No, I mean, there is no, I mean, what you would assume only that it's invariant with respect to V. Yeah, that's what, yeah, I mean, this type of things. I mean, typically whatever you do should be invariant on the V. But again, it's typically not a problem for compact manifolds, etc. Uh, right. So let's write this W in linearized terms. So my W would be the following. So just look what I would like to do. So I'm now looking at everything abstractly. So imagine I have some uh, scalar product. So psi. I zero X. So this term is this term. So I'm pulling W. I mean, I'm don't write delta first. So this is just this term up to linearized level. And then here I will have next thing is a chi H minus I DX. I put a I just because I like to put I. Okay, so it's uh, just exactly these things, but everything written at linearized level, etc. And again, I start to use more and more abstract notations because I want to uh, give you fi infinite dimensional uh, interpretation pretty soon. Okay, so what I would like that uh, my algebra is satisfied and one of the conditions I would like that this is true. So actually, the only thing we have to fulfill is the following property between R, D, minus D, R0 is equal to 0. So you can check it. I leave for you as an exercise is to do it. So again, I introduce different operations. So this is my operations, linear operations, which enters in the um, transformations. Then this is some term related to zero of section, which I want to, you know, localize, etc. So this is first thing. Another thing I have to assume, and again, this would be very obvious, that with respect to products, I typically will have this property. I will tell you why I'm assuming this in a moment. So when I'm moving, so this would be both for 0 and 1, 0 and 1. So it meaning that R0 dagger is equal to minus R0, R1 dagger is equal to minus R1. So this is very obvious property, which you know, this is typically, uh, so, I zero, it's like a lead derivative. And when you move lead derivative in a scalar product, assuming that metric is invariant, it exactly gives you minus. So LV is not a Hermitian operator, but I LV is a Hermitian operator. So that's why I'm assuming that these operations are anti-Hermitian. Of course, I can make them Hermitian by putting appropriate eyes. Uh, but in a way, this is very important when you do this calculation abstractly. So you write this operators, so you have to figure out how to move the things, things around. Well, here I'm not assuming anything. If I move here, I will just put explicitly D dagger. 
Okay. Good. So for example, if I write rho zero, rho zero dagger, this is the same as a minus rho square. Okay. So now let's work it out and let's write, let me hit by delta <coughs> this. So I will have delta w is equal to, this is i zero x, i zero x, minus psi i zero psi plus h minus i d x h minus minus chi r one chi plus e d psi. So you can see that H centers only quadratically and there are no any operations on H. So if I put in the integral, we can integrate H. So after this, I will get the following. Delta W is equal to X minus R zero square plus one over four D dagger D x minus psi i zero psi minus chi r one chi minus chi i over two d psi plus psi i over two d dagger chi I'm just copying, but again, it's just applying supersymmetry. So what I did here, because H just enters quadratically, I can integrate this in pass integral. I can do this Gaussian integration. So now you see that um, I have this is bosonic term. So this is analog of this term we had before, H mu nu, X mu, X nu. So this is analog of this term. Okay, and then uh, all the remaining terms, it's a fermionic terms, it's exactly these terms, S mu nu, psi mu, psi nu. And the story is exactly the same as before. That's why I'm not repeating for some details, but uh, that's what we get at the level of operators, okay? So now it, it seems that, you know, we know the answer, whatever we observe will we'll integrate, it will be evaluated at zero, but then we have to think about determinants here. So in determinants, well, we know what will be up there. So if you calculate, then uh, the answer will be looking the following. You will get here downstairs determinant one over two minus R zero square plus one over four D dagger D. So this is a bosonic integration. And up there, I will get a fermionic. So let me instead of phi fan write like this, or so you can write phi fan, but this will be R0, I over two, D dagger minus one over two, D R one. So this is my basically zeta. I mean, they can be some observable evaluated the points, but I mean, we are concentrating on determinants. This is something much less trivial. So psi and chi are like real spin mm -hmm. Psi and chi. <coughs> spinner. Real spinner. I'm not talking about spinners. I'm just saying, you know, it's... Uh, 
one of the things is that uh, don't try to bring all words at once. I did not talk about spinners. They are not here at all. I said I'm taking a vector bundle. I just reverse parity. Where is spinner? No, I just either you are a spinner or not. I mean, you know, it's uh, don't bring stuff which I'm not talking about. Maybe Guido talked last week. I'm not a super similar. I mean, I'm talking, I'm stressing this. There are no spinners here. It's a Grassmannian variables. The only thing you have to keep track, uh, I will comment towards the end about supersymmetry. But right now, you know, everything is pretty formal, but it's important. Okay. Uh, this is a vector bundle and I just reverse parity. So some guys are treated as a Grassmannian variable, some as non-Grassmannian. I guess the question was also, is Psi dagger or just Psi? Is a Psi dagger just Psi? Uh, uh, you can ask what is Psi? Psi is dx, is dx dagger is dx? Hmm? Yeah. No, but you're asking questions which do not make sense. It's simply your problem is you know too much. I mean, the, I mean you should not ask these questions. Otherwise, you, you get in a trouble. You start to discuss Majorana conditions in the place where they do not exist. Okay, so it's, uh, I'm just, basically what I'm doing is I'm integrating a differential form on the vector bundle. The problem is that if you actually try, I mean, one of the things is why you uh, apply, I mean, use the supersymmetry, etc. It's very hard if I will start for you to write d chi, you get even more confused. So instead of writing differentially, you introduce more and more letters. And in infinite dimensional setup, you cannot do it without this, right? I mean, that's, that's exactly the problem. But eventually what we are doing, we're just integrating um, differential forms on the vector bundle. And we have to construct things which is well defined, etc. Any uh, que other questions? I have questions about the variation of W. Why the second term is minus? I don't know. I mean, just do calculation. Maybe I call, I mean, I don't want to do calculation. Uh, you just do, you know, you take the things you, you did. I act the data on W that you defined. Uh -huh. The second term must be a plus sign, right? But don't, don't, I mean, delta, when it jumps over odd guy, it, it picks up minus, right? So here, what is important? Okay, I, I mean, so uh, this is even, this is odd. So this is odd, right? So when I will write for you delta psi on, I don't know, mu, uh, V mu, then this is formula as a following. This is delta psi mu V mu minus psi mu delta V mu. Did you use this property? So here, Whatever odd stuff jumps or odd stuff, you put minus. So this is the rule of the game. Okay. So because delta is odd, it jumps over this, you put minus. Otherwise, it will not be uh, have a correct property of uh, superderivation. Any other questions? Okay. So let's uh, massage the thing, etc. So first of all, uh, what is important? Uh, for these guys to make sense. Um, so this operator should be well defined. And for example, this operator should be non-degenerate because if these operators will have a big kernels, we're in trouble, right? So if these guys have a kernel, which is big kernel, then uh, you know this is not good. So typically, this is second order. So what I think I will not have a time today, but let me already mention some words. So basically, what would be important for this calculation to make sense, uh, the word is non-degenerate, positive, etc. We actually will have to require. So this is R zero square in the field theory. Will have to be a second order, second order elliptic operator. So now about this operator which stands there. So let, uh, you can do the following exercise. So let me write for you these formulas. So this will be R0, I over 2, D dagger, minus I over 2, D R1. Then you write the same guy, but you put a dagger. One, no, 
or result or I don't know. You check it. Okay. Uh, I think I have I here, but I'm not sure. I mean, my handwriting is not very clear. Uh, but it's easy to establish. What I want to get here, so I will get minus r zero square plus one over two, uh, one over four d dagger d. Then here I will have one over two i zero d dagger minus d dagger r one. I over two d i zero minus r one d minus one uh, sorry minus r one square plus one over four d d dagger. I mean, I hope I did not screw up. Uh, I mean, I was writing my notes for a.m. Um, today in the morning, so I hope I did it. But anyhow, it's very trivial. You can check everything. So I mean, conceptually, I'm not lying. In details, I may be lying. Now, what is important here, if you uh, remember original condition. So at some point, I told you that uh, this condition, R1, D minus DR0 equal to 0. So these terms are gone. <coughs> so this is very important. So then if you now plug these things in this stuff and massage them a bit more, then the actually what you will get. So what you will get eventually, blah, blah, blah. So, so data will be proportional to determinant 1 over 4 minus r1 square plus 1 over 4 d d dagger determinant 1 over 4 minus i0 square plus 1 over 4 d dagger d So you see one y on y one over four appears because this is like a square of this operator times conjugate. So I have a determinant, and this is determinant uh, one over two. So I have to take another square, and then I will have here some two copies, so some things will cancel out. So it's one over four actually. And also remember that uh, here the order is different because this is operators on different spaces. One. Uh, thinks it acts on this space and some it acts on this space. So the question is, uh, which we, I will start to make some comments now, but then uh, we'll discuss when does it make sense. Again, uh, just to keep in mind, so let me just make two statements for you. So this is analog of this statement, actually. So this is what we are calculating. It's a determinant of S of a determinant of H. If I use these conditions, I actually can reduce this a bit further on. But we will discuss it. So actually, it can formally go down to the following things. So it's a determinant of 1 over 2 of R1, determinant 1 over 2 R0. So this is uh, analogous to this thing. So this is second order things, this is first order. This I can see just from linearized transformations because linearized transformations have only this and this. However, in fact, if you think about it, so there will be huge cancellations. So in fact, uh, these things are done. Um, so to be more precise, if you massage the thing, so you have to play with this condition. So this condition is extremely important. So
so this is actually also equal to uh, a determinant of on the kernel of d d dagger of minus r one square and I don't need to put squares, I can put here one halves. I mean, I'm not discussing phases. D dagger D of minus R zero square. So if you want to derive this formula, uh, you just have to use, um, so use R one D minus D R zero. So basically, the thing is that outside of this kernel, there will be huge constellations. Okay. So please remember all these formulas. Because we need them quite a lot. Um, so I have to finish, but let me say some words. Um, what next I will discuss for you, so now uh, the issue is the following. So when we can, so imagine we're doing this in infinite dimensional setting. So in finite dimensional setting, everything is fine. And the only conditions actually, you have to choose good vector field. You have to choose good section. You have to make sure that things are decaying and integral is fine. I mean, well-defined, etc. And then you calculate these determinants, which is again, not that bad. In infinite dimensional setup, things become more complicated. So you have this linear operations. And the thing is, I have to tell you exactly when I can calculate. Because despite the fact that it's written well, right? For example, nobody tells me that I will be able to calculate this. So there are conditions on the operators to be defined, etc. So for example, um, what I will... Uh, you know, discuss for you, and also next time I will give you some very concrete models. So we'll discuss what does it mean operator to be elliptic, what does it mean to be transversely elliptic, and also I have to figure out which conditions I have. So for example, I mean, I start that this should be always second order uh, elliptic operator. Then, for example, for these things to make sense, I mean, when these things is actually well defined. So I will tell you that uh, D should be, for example, transversely elliptic. It can be elliptic, but it can be re relaxed to be transversely elliptic. So I don't want to start with this, but next time I'm going to talk about uh, elliptic, transversely elliptic operators, and also I will mention for you index theorems. So if by any chance you don't know anything about differential geometry, you have one day to read Nakahara. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know yet. So I will assume that you have a good idea about characteristic classes, etc. So tomorrow, I mean, so remember this formula. So tomorrow I will write them again and I will go for now some infinite dimensional examples which fit this framework completely. And I will try to explain you. It's still not 5D. Eventually I will come to 5D. But I will do 2D, 3D some examples to tell you what's the difference, etc. And also to explain you the stages history of localization, because in old days, in 80s, I mean, Witten would write like this, and it will be equal to one or minus one. That was the you know highest science. Uh, now it's you know it's a bit more complicated. So this is in fact, if you put whole things, it can be rather complicated and interesting functions. So this is what I will do tomorrow. So I will do this uh, more math part, etc. Index theorems. And yeah, I think that's it for today. Uh, any questions you have on the stuff I told you? Yeah. So why is the first equality true? Or, you know, Sorry, why? Why is the first equality true? Why is the first equality true? Why this is true? Yes. Uh, because of this. So, um, one of the things is what I suggest to you is that, I mean, the formulas which I told you, derive them yourself. And this has become the complication now that I always will do the same what I, I, I did. So the whole localization in life, it's Atiyah bot, okay? Nothing else. But it's Atiyah bot on infinite dimensional super manifolds, etc. You always will have these tangent bundles, etc. 
So always keep in mind, and I highlight for you, this is one step calculation, this is a second step calculation. So if you want to arrive here, you use exactly the same thing. This is like, you know, this is type of conditions you are using. So this is equal to zero. So that's how you use it, but it's exactly this. So dv zero is equal to zero. So a priori naively, nothing should depend on this d d dagger. Because D, it's a thing which enters through BRST exact term. But these are operations, it's the only operations which enter transformations. So, I mean, derive yourself, but this is exactly a step from here to here. 